Well, welcome back to Biology. Uh, this is Mr. Kabuski again, chatting with you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, our Unit 11, which was energy. Last time we got together, we talked about photosynthesis, which is the process that plants undertake to convert sunlight and some uh, gases into uh, glucose or sugar, and they put off oxygen as a byproduct. So today we're going to talk about what we do and what really all eukary eukaryotic organisms do with that sugar and oxygen. And we do a process called cellular respiration, which is what we're going to discuss today. So, what is cellular respiration? It's the process of converting sugar and oxygen okay, into water and carbon dioxide, which are both byproducts. Uh, they're useful byproducts in that we put off carbon dioxide that the plants can use and that we take in uh, that water. We keep that water for ourselves and we use it in our bodies. But the real reason we do cellular respiration is to get energy. And remember, uh, back from semester one, the energy source for our bodies is something called ATP. Now, the chemical reaction for this uh, states C6H12O6 plus uh, O2 gives us CO2 plus H2O plus energy, which is interesting because if you think back to the last thing we talked about, which was photosynthesis, photosynthesis takes in CO2, H2O, and energy from the sun to create sugar and oxygen. So these are reciprocal reactions, meaning that they're just opposites of one another. Plants take in this give off this. We take in this, give off this. It's interesting that we have a little symbiotic relationship uh, between the two uh, chemical reactions. It's a little mutualistic relationship. So let's go further, but it's important that you do understand that those go together. The photosynthesis and cellular respiration are just hand in hand, just opposites of one another. They feed one another. Okay. Uh, this process of cellular respiration takes place in the mitochondria of eukaryotic cells. There are some important parts of the mitochondria that you need to know, just like we need to know some parts of the chloroplast for photosynthesis. Those parts are the matrix, which is the fluid inside the cell, Okay, specifically inside the inner membrane. So that's the next one, the inner membrane. Remember uh, back from unit three when we talked about cells, we talked about how mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane and had all these little folds in it. Well, those folds are called cristae, and it's these cristae that are going to be the sites of the actual cellular respiration. So really, cellular respiration takes place on these inner folds. Then why do we need all these folds? Well, we'll get into that in a second. Make sure you label uh, all the parts of the mitochondria, okay? So why is it important to have that folded membrane? What's the advantage? Why not just have a straight one? Okay. Well, let's look at our two uh, examples of mitochondria here. We have our one on the left that has an inner membrane that perfectly matches the outer membrane. And then we have the one on the right that has this convoluted shape here of inner membrane where it weaves in and out throughout the entire mitochondria. Well, which one is at an advantage? Which one can do more chemical reactions? Well, if I take each line and I stretched it out, and that's just to scale now, if I stretch it up, if I took this red one and just cut it in half, this is the first that would go. But if I cut the green one in half and stretch it out, it would be almost double the size of the red one. Well, why? Well, the reason is each of these folds increases the surface area. It increases how much of the inner membrane we can stuff into the outer membrane. And that's important because these inner membranes, since they're the site of the chemical reaction, the longer my uh, inner membrane is, the more ATP I can create because the more chemical reactions I can do. So the folded membrane with the cristae increases our surface area, which increases the amount of ATP that we can produce, hence why we have uh, inner membrane with folds. So there are two types of cellular respiration. Uh, one uh, is when oxygen is present. The other is when oxygen is not present. So let's say I'm going to go do an exercise, right? And I'm just going to go for a light jog. I'm going to jog for, let's say, 25 minutes. Well, what type of exercise is that? Well, we call that aerobic respiration. We call it aerobic exercise. Respiration. What the heck am I talking about? Uh, aerobic uh, exercise because I'm constantly taking in and breathing out. Okay, I'm taking in oxygen at a regular rate. I'm not trying to go sprinting. I'm not using up too much of that my oxygen reserves and my sugar reserves too quickly. Okay, so this is called aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is in the presence of oxygen. If there's no oxygen present, let's say I'm going to go do like 10 wind sprints, we call that anaerobic. Okay, That would be an anaerobic uh, exercise, and this is anaerobic respiration because oxygen is not present. We've used up all of the oxygen reserves, and we can't replace them fast enough. Okay, Think about why you breathe so heavy after running sprints or after playing in a basketball game, stuff like that. It's because you've used up your oxygen reserves, and we've had to go to other sources for energy. 
those other sources, okay, uh, for energy. If it's a plant, they go through something called alcoholic fermentation, okay? It's the process that they can still make energy without oxygen present. In the process, they create a byproduct, which is alcohol, ethanol, okay? And there you can see Homer enjoying some of his alcoholic fermentation, okay? The fruits of alcoholic fermentation. If it takes place in animals, we go through a cycle called lactic acid fermentation. So again, if there's no oxygen present, but our bodies need energy, they have another source they can go to, but the problem is it creates this byproduct, which is lactic acid. If you've ever gone for a run and then felt like you've hit the wall, but then you run a little bit further and you feel good again, that's because you're actually switching over from alcohol, or excuse me, from aerobic respiration, you're hitting the wall, and now you're going on to lactic acid fermentation. Okay, so it's the time when your body's actually switching uh, cycles. It's going from one to the other. Okay. Now, the downside of lactic acid fermentation is that if you've ever felt sore after a workout, uh, it's because of the one of the things is the cause of it is uh, lactic acid buildup inside your legs or inside your arms or whatever your soreness or wherever your soreness is. That's just one of the reasons. There's several, but we'll talk more about that in my next class, which is sports and exercise health science. So, what are the steps of aerobic cellular respiration? Now. When you go to take uh, more advanced biology classes, AP Bio or college biology, okay, you're going to really dive into these processes, these steps. They're going to get really complicated and convoluted, which is fine. I mean, it's the way that it is. For my class, however, and sorry, I don't know why I'm yawning. For my class, however, we're just going to take the basics, like what goes in, what comes out, where does it take place. So glycolysis. Glycolysis requires two ATP to get the process started. So we have to have some energy source to get the process started. It also requires glucose, which is why you know, we take in glucose. It's to start this process of glycolysis. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm, and when it's done, it will produce NADH, pyruvic acid, something called acetyl coenzyme A, which I didn't add on here, okay, and four ATP. So I use two to make four, a grand, a grand total of two ATP as a gain. Good for us. Now, if oxygen is present, I will continue on to step two. Okay, here's what glycolysis looks like. Here's our glucose. Here's ATP. Remember the two ATP we used, and then here's the four ATP we gained. Okay, and then here's the pyruvates we get at the end. Okay, step two is called the Krebs cycle, the Krusty Krebs. It takes place in the mitochondria. It requires oxygen and the, one of the byproducts of glycolysis, that acetyl coenzyme A. And in the end, it'll produce two ATP, NADH and FADH2, which are both electron carriers. If you remember that back from photosynthesis, we talked about things that carry electrons. They're almost always going to end in an H, okay, because the H is a proton. The free electron comes together. They make a hydrogen atom. Anyways, and then one of the byproducts of the Krebs cycle is carbon dioxide. So this is why we breathe out carbon dioxide. It's because of the crusty Krebs cycle. Now, the Krebs cycle, again, really complicated, but this is actually a pretty good representation of how the process works. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to memorize the steps or know the steps. Okay, all you need to know is what the what goes in and what comes out of the Krebs cycle. And then the last step is the ETC. We're going to hop on the ETC, the electron transport chain. The ETC is important because it gives us 32 ATP. That's right, 32. So the other ones gave us two, which was great, a piece. But this one gives us 32. It's obviously pretty important. It takes in oxygen and those electron carriers, and it produces the three ATP and it also produces water as a byproduct. Okay, Now, that water you'll never see necessarily. You may say, oh, well, I pee it out. Well, that's a half true. Okay, and water The water just gets added to your cells. Now, if you have too much water, you know, then you pee it out, obviously, but that's not necessarily where the water goes. So let's take a look at the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain, again, takes place on this criste, the inner folds of the inner membrane. So let's go ahead and label the parts. We have our outer compartment, we have our matrix, and here's our inner membrane. So now we have kind of a rough idea of what we're working with. Now the inner membrane is full of these pumps and channels. Okay, over here we have two proton pumps, and what that means is that they're going to use the energy of an electron to move a H plus or a proton across the membrane. Okay, so let's see how that happens. So we have NADH, we said it's an electron carrier, so we're going to split it into three parts. NAD plus a free electron, and H+, plus, which is just a proton. Now, since this is a pump, we have to use energy. So we're going to use the energy of this electron to move the hydrogen ion, or the proton, across the membrane. 
Now this electron still has some energy, so let's use it again to move even more hydrogen across. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll use that, uh, that electron one more time to pump even more hydrogen across. Now you're starting to notice we're getting a, a concentration of hydrogens up here, okay, and not as many down here. Well, that's going to be important for what we're going to see next, okay? So we'll do this process one more time. Now I'm starting to get a buildup of these electrons, these electrons that have no more energy left. So I have to find a way to get rid of them, otherwise they'll just fill up my, my space in my cells. So what we do is we combine two electrons with two hydrogen ions, or H pluses, and if we take those and we combine them with an oxygen, when we put it all together, we get water. So oxygen's whole purpose, the reason we breathe in oxygen, is to just accept those extra electrons. Now again, with the water we'll get rid of, it's no big deal. Now, look at what we have here. We have five hydrogens on the top and only one hydrogen left on the bottom. Think about the natural way things want to work. What will happen here? Well, the hydrogens are going to want to move from an area of high concentration to low. It's not going to use energy to do that. It's a natural process. But what we can do okay, is we can harness the energy of their movement to convert ADP and a free phosphate into ATP. That only happens because of the movement of hydrogen from high concentration to low through this channel. So, if you could, get out the posters that we started last time we got together and talked about photosynthesis. On the back side of those posters, we're going to do the exact same thing we did for photosynthesis, but just with aerobic respiration. So write aerobic respiration, write the requirements and the products of it at the top of the page. There are two requirements and three products. In the middle, we're going to draw this picture. And again, just like last time, you're going to look at it and say, oh my god, what the heck does this mean? But all this is is just a representation of the three steps of aerobic respiration. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the ETC. Glycolysis took in glucose to make ATP. It put off two byproducts that got sent to the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle takes in oxygen to make two ATP and produces carbon dioxide, which we get rid of. The two electron acceptors move on to the electron transport chain, which also takes in oxygen, and then it puts off 30, should be 32 ATP plus the water that our cells keep. Okay, but again, it's still considered a byproduct. Okay, these two processes take place in the mitochondria, which is why we have the mitochondria drawn behind it. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm outside the mitochondria. And then make sure you label the parts of the mitochondria. Finally, there's a brief description of what we just got done talking about. Okay, the step one would be glycolysis, step two would be the Krebs, and step three is the electron transport chain. The bolded words are the words that appear in the picture. So, to review, what is cellular respiration? It's the process that converts sugar and oxygen into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. A total of 36 ATP. What are the types of cellular respiration? There's aerobic and anaerobic, and then inside anaerobic, there's alcoholic fermentation and lactic acid fermentation, depending on if you're a plant or an animal. And then the steps of aerobic cellular respiration, there's glycolysis was step one, there was the Krebs cycle, and then there's the electron transport chain. Okay, again, it's kind of a complicated idea. It's one of the more complicated ideas in biology because there's so many moving parts and so many pieces. But you got to think, we, over mi billions of years, we've kind of perfected these processes of photosynthesis and respiration. And without them, we couldn't have life on the planet. So they're going to be kind of complicated. But hopefully, those posters and this little animation and the, the little discussion we just had, hopefully it's a good review or at least an introduction into the idea of how cellular respiration works. If you still have questions, comment contact me, jkubuski at gocathedral.com, uh, that's K-U-B-U-S-K-E, or visit the website mrkubuski.wordpress.com, and you can also follow me on Twitter at Coach Kibuski. This actually will do it for us. Uh, it's been a great year. It's been fun working with you. Hope you learned something. Uh, please don't stop learning. Biology is an amazing subject, and we've just started beginning to touch on these uh, big ideas. Please take some more advanced classes and really start diving into it. You'd be amazed what you can find. But I really appreciate you watching. Hope you have a great day. And again, contact me if there's anything you need. Take care.